Hi, I'm and I'm Anthony, and this is Words and Numbers. Somebody sent me a thing about Wendy's. The CEO at a stockholder meeting said that Wendy's was going to experiment with surge pricing. Surge pricing in times of high demand, you charge more. And the whole gist of it was that they were installing in Wendy's these electronic signs so they could alter prices at any point. When it became public, people lost their minds. He quickly backpedaled and said, well, it's not for surge pricing, it's for discount pricing, which underlines my whole point here. We see this surge pricing business and we go to, well, the company's just trying to exploit the consumer. and Kind of like they do at concerts and ball games and airline tickets. And yeah, but that's the thing. We're surrounded by surge pricing all the time. We just don't call it surge time. We just don't call it surge pricing. We call it discounting. The movie tickets during the day are less the happy hours at bars or off-season prices for tourist destinations is just the other way. So instead of saying, well, I'm going to charge you $7 during the day and I'm going to raise it to $10 at night, you say, I'm going to charge you $10, but I'll give you a $3 discount during the day. It's the same thing. It doesn't matter which way you describe it. The prices are the same. $7 one time, $10 the other. It matters quite a lot which way you describe it. It matters psychologically. But in the end, it has no bearing. The numbers are the same numbers. This is the difference between politics and economics. Yeah, I'm not saying that it doesn't have an impact on the person. I'm saying that mathematically, it's the exact same thing. And if someone thinks there's a difference, it's purely psychological. This is why economists have so much trouble. <laughs> This is why we just shake our heads at the rest of the population. You shake our heads at the rest of the population. You get a bunch of autistics. They all sit together and they say, well, it's clear that this is the correct answer. And almost always, that's right. It is the correct answer. But that is not how people want to hear it. I started to do some research on this and ran across an article you and I had written back in 2015, 2014 on surge pricing. And I'd forgotten this. There was an incident in Sydney, Australia, where a gunman had taken some hostages. And of course, everybody wants to get out of the business district where this was happening in Sydney. Uber's surge pricing kicks into effect and people were losing their minds. And we said, look, this has a beneficial effect that everybody's missing. And the beneficial effect is when the price goes up, people who don't need to use an Uber right then choose not to because it's too expensive, making Ubers available for people who do need them. Meanwhile, Uber driver drivers who are just sitting at home because they decide it's not worth it to drive, all of a sudden now they look and they say, wow, I can get twice as much. It's worth it to me. And they bring their cars onto the streets. And so there are now more cars. So the surge pricing actually is beneficial to everyone if we can get over this hump, the knee-jerk reaction that, well, this is just the business trying to exploit consumers. I want to preface what I'm about to say by reminding you that this is not the foolishness of the week. This headline, the U.S. national debt is rising by $1 trillion about every 100 days. Was it Obama's administration that we had the first trillion dollar deficit? We've been over three a couple of times. Because of COVID. And I'm actually, yeah, those it's were special circumstances. Well, I was looking at this graph just a couple of days ago of the federal debt over time. And you could see it, you know, rising, rising, rising as it does until you hit COVID and then it spikes way up. But then COVID's over, but it doesn't come back. It comes down a little bit, but it doesn't come back nearly to where it would have been had COVID not occurred. It's almost as if the government learned something. Yeah, you can use these instances to expand government and then nobody's looking and you just keep it the way it was. You know, it's kind of like being on a diet. You look around at all the good food and you think, oh, I can't have any of that. Ah, but alas, today is a special occasion. And before you know it, there's a special occasion every week. We enumerated them and it turns out there's a special occasion fiscally about every 10 years. Every 10 years, it's some once-in-a-lifetime event, except you get one every 10 years. <laughs> every, every 10 years, right. So here we are at a trillion every 100 days. Let me underline something here because we're going to get mail on this. Now that I'm doing the math in my head, 
a trillion every hundred days. That would be over a year. That can't be right. This is from CNBC.com. If you want to take issue with anybody, go take issue with them. Well, let me read a little bit to you. The nation's debt permanently crossed over to $34 trillion on January 4th after briefly crossing the mark on December 29th, according to data from the U.S. Department of Treasury. It reached $33 trillion on September 15th and $32 trillion. What the hell? Ah, you might be right. This person might be confused. But there's something else that goes on, which is the, the government's revenue and spending isn't necessarily smooth throughout the year. So they may have picked a particular place where it went up quickly. I think looking at the graph, they might have done that. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave it to you to take a look. But there's uh, an interesting flat line on the debt from January 2023 till June 2023. I do know that CNBC tends to be pretty good about percent. Give them three years. <laughs> the number will be right. <laughs> oh, oh, Ant, I think sometime late next year, <laughs> given the way things are going. This brings us to the foolishness of the week. Political pundit Ezra Klein in an article in the New York Times, and this is a transcript from the Ezra Klein show. We're dealing with a, a copy of a copy of a copy, but nonetheless, Ezra opines that Joe Biden is likely more trouble than he's worth for the Democratic Party at this point. I think that's a conclusion that a lot of people, if they're not there, they're part of the way there. Each of the major candidates has more than a little baggage. Ezra Klein says, well, he opens by saying, my heart breaks a bit for Joe Biden, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think his answer to the problem of Joe Biden is? Oh, I'm going to guess that his answer is he needs to run nonetheless, save us all from the alternative. No, that would be a way better conclusion than what Ezra Klein comes up with. Ezra Klein tells us that what we really need is for Joe Biden to step down at the convention and we need to have a brokered convention that will what? Give us Kamala Harris. So he's one of the 15% who like Kamala? You know, that's just it, right? She's so dreadful that almost anybody would prefer a demented Joe Biden to a fully functional Kamala Harris. And yet, what does he say? I think Harris is underrated now. I've thought this for a while. I've said this before, that I think she's going to have a good 2024. Is she a political juggernaut, a generational political talent? Probably not. But she's a capable politician, which is one reason Biden chose her as his running mate in the first place. No, no, it's not. Biden chose her as his running mate. Neither of them is that. But here's where it gets fascinating. She has not thrived as vice president. The D.C. narrative on her has turned extremely negative. But when Kamala Harris ran campaigns as Kamala Harris, this wasn't how she was seen. And Harris, in private settings, she's enormously magnetic and compelling. I don't know what planet he's from. If the Democrats wanted to find a surefire way to usher Donald Trump into the White House, trust me, this is it. Well, I, I was going to argue the other direction. Maybe Ezra is carrying water for the Democratic Party because clearly they're not going to have a brokered convention and nominate her, but he's got the Democrats thinking, well, Kamala, maybe. And as long as they can think, maybe she becomes much more palatable as a vice president. In other words, she doesn't drag Joe Biden down nearly as much. When we came nearly as much. When we came up with the idea of the foolishness of the week, this is what we had in mind right here. I think what's asinine about the whole thing is that we're having this conversation at all. If the Democrats really want to win, the minimal thing they could do is replace her with someone who's palatable. And that's it. Biden would win. I think that's right. There's been some scuttlebutt about maybe some sort of unity ticket with Nikki Haley at the top and a Democrat as the vice president. And I think, you know, that's going nowhere, especially now. You know, in the end, this is Trump v. Biden, too. And we're right back where we started. The election nobody wanted the first time and the election nobody wanted the second time. For one-stop shopping for all things James and Ant, visit our website, wordsandnumbers.org. 
we give a special really shout out to our Patreon sponsors had, who help I, us I keep the lights on. I don't think we had any like words and numbers. We've got a raft of problems, and as usual, they're coming from both sides of the aisle. And I'm becoming deeply concerned about the long-term health of what was once a republic. I'm listening. Well, first time for everything. <laughs> I don't have much of a choice. You just keep talking. <laughs> well, now you know how it feels. I'm the one who barely says anything. You just yammer on and on and on. I guess this week it's my turn. We're looking at some problems that people aren't fully appreciating on both sides of the aisle. So I'm going to start with Trump and the Republicans. The Republicans are facing an absolute disaster. It's a disaster the likes of which they have not seen and that they are not fully cognizant is coming. Let me lay out some of the reality. Here you've got a president or a former president who has incurred massive legal bills, and we all know what they are legal bills, and we all know what they are. And he's got a couple of gigantic judgments against him that, including the interest on the second one, are now over half a billion dollars. Half a billion. With a B. And he pretty clearly does not have half a billion dollars in cash to pay these off because he's panicking. And he's making long shot crackpot legal claims to try to forestall having to pay these things. And the judge is not having it. He's got 30 days and he's got to pay. Mm -hmm. And that's that. He tried to renegotiate the judgment after it was entered. I heard that. Because apparently he thinks you can renegotiate everything. But once a judge signs a piece of paper, you're done there. Suppose the 30 days comes and he doesn't pay. What happens? He'll get all of his properties confiscated. He might go to jail. He will pay. There's no way around that. Right. Yeah, but suppose money, what happens? They take everything because that's how it works. And that doesn't take into account the massive legal fees that he's incurred to get these cases lawyered. Mm -hmm. He's bled cash into these things, so much so that he has two packs, super packs, and he's bankrupted both of them. They both now have no money because they've been paying his legal bills. How's he going to run for the presidency if his PACs have no money? It's worse than that. No, he's got a plan for this. He's doing his best, and he will likely succeed, in replacing the leadership at the Republican National Committee, the RNC, and his daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, blurted out, I guess it was last week, that once she's co-chair... All the money from the RNC goes to her father-in-law. And that apparently is legal. Well, they can make whatever rules they want if they take over the leadership. Rules they want if they take over the leadership. But here's the thing. The RNC money, all the other elections, goes to the presidential candidate, yes, because that's really important. But it also goes to the downstream congressional candidates, and it goes to gubernatorial candidates. But now she says it's all going to go to Donald Trump. Who's going to pay for all those other races? Now, those guys are going to raise money on their own, to be sure, but they are going to be at a severe competitive disadvantage. And just to give you an idea how bad it is right now, the RNC has $8 million in its accounts. $8 million. $8 million. It's not even worth his time to raid that money. Well, he thinks they'll get more. Joe Biden, on the other hand, last month raised $42 million. Good God. Last month. Mm -hmm. Presumably, then, he can do that every month. That's the kind of competitive disadvantage. Add to that, you've got Trump running. He's already lost to Biden. He's alienated the independent voters that sit in the middle that decide every presidential election. They will, in droves, go for Biden, which means he has no chance of winning. So what happens if he's got to come up with this money in 30 days? It's currently the end of February. That means by the end of March, he needs that money. And if he's going to siphon it off the RNC, the RNC is then left bankrupt come April. How do they field any candidates anywhere, including him as president? Well, people are going to have to raise their own money. And they do. Or it's not that these people won't get any money. Okay, okay. They just won't get any help from the RNC. Okay. So every competitive race that the RNC would have poured resources into to win, mm -hmm. now they'll all be on their own. 
Right. I want you to remember how many candidates that Trump has endorsed have won over the past four years. And I believe the answer is zero. I mean, you've got Marjorie Taylor Greene and that little crowd. Apart from that, in competitive seats, they don't win. Trump is the kiss of death. So the Republicans are up against the wall. They have real problems. And I don't see a solution. I mean, the only solution is to dump him. And it might already be too late. Well, if he's taken over the party leadership, I don't see how they do. He hasn't yet. That's in process. But I don't know that anybody's got the guts to do it. I do know that big Republican donors aren't giving money to the RNC, and they're all terrified. They don't know what the hell to do. All right, so let's follow this through. Let's suppose for the sake of argument that he does bankrupt the RNC and does successfully take over the leadership. What happens then? Do former Republican voters, supporters go out and start a new party? I don't know. My guess guess is that the Republican Party falls apart on various cleavages and that the MAGA types, the nationalist types, find themselves out in the cold. This will relegate the Republican Party, whatever reformulates in its wake, to minority status for decades. Well, maybe, maybe not, because there's that 42% of Americans who don't identify with either party just sitting there waiting to be picked up. Yeah, but there's a gigantic but with this, right? Because a bunch of them, maybe 25 to 30 percent, hang Democrat and always vote that way. And an equal number of them hang Republican and always vote that way. So they claim to be independent, but their voting patterns are partisan. What it comes down to is about 10, 11 percent of the population that are truly independent, and they decide presidential elections. But hang on, admit that that group that describe themselves as independent but consistently vote either Republican, Democrat, I would argue that they're simply voting for what they consider the lesser of the evils. And if a new party came along that positioned itself in the middle as a reasonable party that took elements from both the Democrats and Republicans that were centrist, I bet you it picks up those people. I disagree with that. I think those people, by and large, are Democrats and Republicans. They just don't like to call themselves that. Hmm. And when you look at presidential candidates, they may well claim, legitimately so, that they're voting for the lesser of two evils. That doesn't make them any less Democrat or any less Republican. It just means they don't like presidential candidates. And frankly, there hasn't been a lot to like in a long time. But really, you're looking at a very small slice of the population that can be swayed, And they determine the outcome of presidential elections. And those people have been alienated by Trump Ripley for years. Mm -hmm. They are not voting for him. They just won't. 75% of them are going to break to Biden. People say it, and I think it's exactly correct. All Biden has to do is not die, not show up on a debate stage. I'm not sure he can do that. The funny thing is that Donald Trump refused to debate his Republican challengers. It would be the smart play for Joe Biden to do the same with Donald Trump. I would be advising him to go nowhere near a debate stage. And if he really wants to cinch the election, replace Kamala Harris with somebody people can stand. Oh, he'd sweep the nation. He might well. But but wait, there's more. You get to the obvious question. If these cleavages in the Republican Party come to the surface and the thing cracks like an egg, which I think is all of a sudden a real danger. And I didn't think this a year ago, but I do think it now. The Democrats, look, your instinct is right. They could do all kinds of stuff. They could drift to the center and become a governing party. But that is not in their DNA. Mm -hmm. They will drift hard left. They'll go near socialist because they can't help it. And they'll alienate a bunch of people, too. How brazen are they right now? I point you to an article in The Atlantic that came out February 23rd, the headline. And I want you to really think about this for a second and all that it means. How Democrats could disqualify Trump if the Supreme Court doesn't. Oh, good Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Now, wasn't this the same shit? that the Democrats were all agitated about when Trump said, well, we don't have to pay attention to this last election. Right. Minus the violence is January 6th. That's right. But wait, there's even more. 
Because at CPAC... What's CPAC? The Conservative Political Action PAC. What's CPAC? The Conservative Political Action Committee. Oh, come on, I wanted to see you get mad. But we've had this discussion once already today. I know, that's why I'm, I'm goading you. So I'm already prepared for your blithering ignorance on the subject. <laughs> I have actually gone to CPAC and sat in the crowd. And I was there when Trump was just a candidate, and I saw the groundswell there. The guy who welcomed people, it was on opening day, said, this is Jack Prasobiech, or however you pronounce that. He said, welcome to the end of democracy. This is being said out loud at CPAC. Welcome to the end of democracy. We're here to overthrow it completely. We didn't get all the way there on January 6th, but we will endeavor to get rid of it and replace it with this right here, he said, holding his fist in the air. That's right, because all glory is not to all glory to God. Yeah. And apparently God hates democracy. I don't have any great insight into the preferred regime type of the Almighty, but apparently this clown does. It's a theocracy. We know how that plays out. Take a look at the Middle East. Except it's not, right? Because... Trump is not a Christian. Trump plays a Christian on TV. At a recent event, he, he claimed that he doesn't go to church because he's too busy fighting for the rights of Christians when everybody else is at church. If anybody buys that, he paid hush money to a porn star. I'm not arguing with you here, but I argue that that's at the root of every theocracy that ultimately the people in charge really don't necessarily believe in the religion. They're using it as an excuse, as a means to gain power. Yeah, and look, I don't want to get into every theocracy. I really don't. We could, and maybe for some future episode, that'd be nice. I lived in one for a while. Yes, that we've got on our hands both sides of the aisle right here, right now. Mm -hmm. The Democrats are in better shape than the Republicans, but they're doing their level best to f*** that up too. Because you know why, Ant, they can't help it. That's what they do. That leads me to a thought I had as you were talking about the meltdown of the Republican Party. And someone can look at that and say, well, this is going to be great news for Democrats because the Republican Party goes bankrupt, it disappears, and now it's just the Democrats. Except the Democrats then will go even further left and they'll end up doing to themselves what has just happened with Trump and the Republicans. Yeah, they will sow the seeds of their own destruction in their glee to get everything they ever wanted. Yeah. And that's their nature. That's always been their nature. So I don't expect them to change their spots anytime soon. And it's even worse on the Republican side. Remember, there are multiple lawsuits yet to come. Mm. And, oh, by the way, Fox News, which is an arm of the Republican Party at this point, faces an existential threat now in the form of a $2.5 billion suit brought by its own shareholders. Really? For what? lying on air all the time about all this nonsense. They're saying that they violated their fiduciary duty to their shareholders. And you know what? They're right. Capitalism to the rescue. <laughs> That's great. I'm not sure that Fox can withstand a $2.5 billion judgment. Yeah. They already paid out a $780 million judgment to Dominion for all the lies they told about the voting machines. Mm -hmm. Well, now their own shareholders are going after them. Their officers are going to be personally on the hook for a bunch of this. The insurance companies are going to have to kick in, and I'm not sure they can live through it. So as bad as the Republican Party is, their PR arm in the form of Fox News, same can, can of worms. And come to find out, telling a bunch of lies comes back at you. Not fast enough and not hard enough for my tastes, but it does come back at you. Add to that the fact that we have not one, but two presidential candidates who are very clearly suffering from early symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. I am not at all sanguine about our short or long-term prospects right now. And that's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Until next time, be sure to follow us on Twitter. Handles are in the show notes. Join Words and Numbers Backstage, the Facebook group where the conversation continues, and send us email, wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. Until next week, try to be nice to one person. One person who doesn't deserve it. Just one. And who knows, it may turn into a trend. 
Give it a shot. You might feel good about yourself. You could say you tried. You tried. That's right. Till next week. Can't take it easy. See you next week, James. Till next week. Can't take it easy. See you next week, James.